Happy New Year, everyone. It is great to be back in the year 2023. Can you believe it's already here? Uh, 2022, I read 61 books and I picked my top 10. Usually I do this every single year. I create a list of the best books that I read. So in this video today, I will tell you just a little bit about each book. Some of them you may have seen on my profiles before, uh, and I'll just explain a little bit about uh, each of the books. And hopefully you find something that you truly enjoy, that you value, and that you, hopefully you can go out and uh, experience these books that I have for you today. All right, so let's get into it. All right, book number one. Starting out here with Your Turn, How to Be an Adult by Julie Lithcott Hames. And I read this one closer to the beginning of the year and finished it in the middle of the year. And I felt like adding it to this list because it has a wide variety of advice, especially for young adults, but also for older adults in their 30s or 40s or even 50s. Um, and so it talks about different topics in the field of just being a better, well-rounded and more organized person. And one of the, my favorite things about this book is the interviews that Julie has chosen to do with people of what a wide variety of backgrounds, uh, and cultures and countries and, um, yeah, it's it's good because when you look at the people living in America, there's a wide variety of different types of people. And I would say that that is the target audience. But no matter where you're from, you'll find value, uh, fundamental human traits that all of us experience. So this is on my top list. Check it out. See if you like it. And uh, we'll go on to the second one. All right, and book number two is Write Useful Books, A Modern Approach to Designing and Refining Recommendable Nonfiction Books by Rob Fitzpatrick. Now, I love reading books about nonfiction writing. This book right here is especially good for those who want to write a nonfiction book get it out there and make it very recommendable for people who read it. Now, often authors, first time authors, or even second time authors may come into this problem where they don't know exactly who they're writing for, which is a positive thing about this book because it gives you practical advice to make sure that you know who you are writing for. That way, when the person picks up the book, they immediately connect with whatever it is that you're writing about and you like pack up a lot of good, valuable information inside uh, a book. It doesn't matter whether it's a short book or a long book, as long as you're providing value to the reader. So this has a lot of practical advice. It doesn't talk a whole lot about the, the writing process itself, but it does give you step-by-step instructions on how to write a book, publish a book that is going to be very recommendable. So highly valuable book here. And on a second note, I had a great podcast episode with the author, Rob Fitzpatrick, about mainly about this book, but I also read a like another one of his books about workshops. And so if you want to check that podcast episode out, uh, maybe I'll include some links below in the description. So check that one out. And then also uh, the Your Turn. I had a podcast episode with Julie as well. So I'll include both of those and for any of the other books that, uh, that we've got coming up here. So uh, yeah, check it out. Let's go on to the third book. Okay, book number three is Building a Second Brain, a Proven Method to organize your digital life and unlock your creative potential by Tiago Forte. I've been following Tiago Forte on social media and YouTube for 
quite some time now. And uh, before I even read this book, I built up my own system for taking digital notes. And of course, this book is all about taking digital notes, whether that be through the books or the podcasts or uh, any observations that you make in your life, and then organizing that uh, information that you get that's valid information into a digital, uh, digital application, not just organizing it in a loose categorical manner, but organizing it that way you can apply that knowledge in your life, which is one of the most important things about reading or learning is being able to apply the information in your life. This book talks about Tiago's method of taking notes and applying the applicable ones into his life. He uh, uses a para method, which I personally don't adapt that to my own note taking. But if you want to know more about that, then read the book. The method that I really like, though, is code, which means capture, organize, distill, and express. So, uh, yeah, of course, when you're first reading and learning, you use the capture, which is basically getting that information and putting it into your own words into the application that you might use. I personally use Remnote. Uh, there's several other applications out there. You could even simplify it and use Google Docs, but I highly recommend using a bi-directional uh, linking app like Rome Research or Remnote. And then uh, the next thing you want to do is organize it in a way that uh, for, for like me, I organize it in some specific area. If it's doing with like a project that I am working on right now, then I would put that in, put that information into that particular area, particular folder. I have folders that I set up. Okay. So that's organization. And the distill is like elaborating on your um, on the things that you have learned in your own words, and you're putting it into the essence of what the main message was when you first read or watched the video or listened to the podcast or something like that. Distill. And then the last one is express. And this is putting your knowledge into action. So if you've got your information organized in like categories uh, or projects, which is kind of something to do with para. Um, but yeah, basically you're going to take the knowledge that is most applicable and you're going to act on it. So I thought this book was brilliant because it gives avid readers and avid learners a way to organize and adapt what uh, Tiago Forte has created, it's not the most original idea ever, but it is a very valuable idea that I think any avid learner and any avid reader should at least try to read through this book. It's a bit fluffy in certain parts and very repetitive, but if you take, if you distill, using one of his words, if you distill the essence of the book, and adapt it to your own liking, great, fantastic. You'll you'll uh, get the book's value in just like 10 pages right? or less, right? So anyway, uh, check it out. It's a great book. Let's go on to number four. All right. Now we've got book number four, The Art and Business of Online Writing, How to Beat the Game of Capturing and Keeping Attention by Nicholas Cole. This one is a great guidebook for anyone who wants to write online. That could be for newsletters or social media or even a, a book, it, although it doesn't talk about books specifically. But yes, uh, it is a fantastic book for um, guiding you to write for the long term, to create like a personal brand almost about the topic that you personally love and you know that will provide value for all your readers. 
it's for the long game, which is another thing that I love because sometimes uh, there's these books out there that suggest, hey, get rich quick type of schemes, so to say. Uh, this one is not like one of those, you know. It's about building up your repertoire of writing and continuing to build that up over time. It also talks about how to reuse content that you've written in the past in different ways and uh, editing it and then republishing it on different platforms. Um, it's an evergreen book, I would say. It is not one of those books that will not be valid in 10 years or 15 years or 20 years from now. Some part of it, parts of it may be, but the concept or the fundamentals of it will last for a very, very long time, as long as people write, which people always write. So uh, it's a definitely a really good book. Um, it will help you to become a thought leader in whatever niche that you want to write in. Uh, it also gives... Uh, lots of good suggestions about how to create niches like sub sub niches, like areas that people are not really writing about now. So uh, I highly recommend it for anyone who wants to write more uh, and you'll get a lot of suggestions about how to write better and how to write so that you can grab attention. So check this one out. Book number five, we are halfway there, everyone. So book number five is The Polymath, Unlocking the Power of Human Versatility by Wakas Ahmed. And uh, I really loved this book because polymathy is a uh, topic that is very interesting to me. I read uh, Leonardo da Vinci by Walter Isaacson last year, and it was on my top list as well. And so this book mentions uh, Leonardo da Vinci as well, because he's one of the most famous uh, polymaths out there. And the book goes through several polymaths, maybe even hundreds of polymaths in one book. Um, people that I hadn't even heard of before. And that interests me because then I could dig deeper. I looked up some of the people that he mentioned in his book and I did a little digging and uh, found some more information about polymathy, uh, the characteristics and traits of a polymath. And uh, so that way, you know, I could start applying some of these aspects in my own life about how I do my work, how I research, how I can truly exercise the characteristics of a polymath in my own way that I live and I work. So if you want to know more about how a poly polymath lives and how you could possibly live more like a polymath, then I recommend checking this one out. And this year, 2023, I'm reading a book that will most likely make it on my top list. Uh, I'll show it to you later in another video. I'm probably on my top 10 list of 2023. It's called The Hidden Habits of Genius. And uh, it covers along the same lines of this one, but it gives even more details about the characteristics of polymaths. So Check this one out if that's something that interests you. And let's go on to book number six. So every year, I've got to have one fiction book on my list. I know I'm primarily primarily a nonfiction guy, but uh, fiction has always held a special place in my heart. So this is the one fiction book uh, that I... Not the one fiction book that I read during the year, but uh, the one that I pick as my best for the year. It's called Shuggy Bane by Douglas Stewart. And um, I, would, I wouldn't have normally read this book, but yeah, it, basically it was part of the co-workers book club, as I call it. Um, 
It's a fiction book club that we just started last year. It's just four people, a couple of people that I work with at the school that I teach at. And uh, we basically pick, each one of us picks a fiction book um, that we would like to read and share with each other and discover new authors and new books that uh, maybe we wouldn't have read before because each of us has a different taste. I'm more into sci-fi and fantasy. Uh, some of the other guys are into literature or drama type of books. Hence the reason why we read this. Um, and the story just really uh, hit me. Like it's about this boy who uh, he's gay and he doesn't really know how to express that because everyone around him kind of makes fun of him for it and uh his mom is an extreme alcoholic his dad is a, a taxi driver who cheats on the mom and then just leaves them but still is kind of part of shugi's life and uh, he's just totally an asshole to shugi and the whole family he's got a brother and a sister who are um, basically, uh, they're, they're much older than him and they are just tired of the mom's bullshit with her drinking and alcoholism. Um, and they, they don't really want to have anything to do with it. So they end up moving out and Shuggy's like basically left alone with his alcoholic mom. And yeah, I just feel bad for the kid he's like 10 11 something like that and just he's in this situation that he really cannot escape and the author did a good job of bringing this to life and making you care so much for the character especially shuggy and uh just having a despising feeling for the mom and the dad you just can't help to feel bad <laughs> and i know i'm making it sound depressing it is but there there are some uh light moments in the book so it's not all dread but uh yeah sometimes i guess human nature we are drawn to situations that bring out pain and this is one of them in the book um, so yeah, I highly recommend it for those who love, and even if you don't love these types of stories, it's written so well, it's written very, very well. So check it out. Okay, cool. So now we're on number seven. After that dark dread previous book, we've got a light book right here. Uh, the Self-Driven Child, The Science and Sense of Giving Your Kids More Control Over Their Lives by William Sticksrud, PhD, and Ned Johnson. I follow Ned on social media. He's very active on there. Uh, he's got a huge education background as well as the other author. And so I love reading parenting and education books. Every single year, I probably read at least uh, four or five. And this one was seriously the best out of all the four or five parenting and uh, education books that I read during last year. And uh, it's got a lot of good tips about how to build resilience in your child. Uh, whether you are a teacher or a parent, and build it in a way that the child uh, builds up their own ability to take care of themselves. It gives them the decision-making control, not completely, obviously, because as a parent or a teacher, we cannot just say it's up to you all the time. Like We have to be there as a guide. We have to be there to help them to make good decisions that way in the future, they know how to make good decisions by themselves. So uh, I really like that. 
that that's very nice as a parent and a teacher. So if you're into these types of books, if you've got kids or you are a teacher, then I recommend reading it because it helps you to really get in the mindset of a child and then helps you know the strategies and tools to help that child to become self-reliant, confident decision makers. Check it out. All right. And this next book is a book that I listened to on audiobook. It's called Genius, The Life and Science of Richard Feynman by James Gleck. And I really enjoyed listening to this in the car. It's a biography. Uh, every day I had about an hour or so, uh, give, give or take, to listen to this book. And it's quite big. Uh, and I was just interested in the life of fine men. Um, fine men, yes. <laughs> I before I always called him Feynman, but yeah, I, I learned that it's pronounced Feynman. Anyway, so uh, yeah, the, I originally got interested in Richard Feynman uh, because he is a very good thinker, and he has a way of explaining very complex topics and simplifying them so that other people can understand other people outside of the the field and you know his life ended in uh what was it was it early 90s um i mean heck i learned a whole lot about this guy that i didn't know before uh like he was a part of the team that created the atomic bomb as well. Although it's something that he didn't ne necessarily want to create uh, because it cost a lot of lives, but um, he was there because it was a job and it, it was one of his passions and uh, science was one of his passions, I should say physics and uh, just discovery of the unknown and so this guy's tenacity, his ability to absorb and create and um, explain in simplified language so that everyone could understand is such an inspiration to me as a creator, as a writer, as a teacher, as a father, as a husband. For me, Richard's life is an inspiration. He is like one of my heroes, uh, even before I started reading the book, but especially afterwards, because I learned a whole lot about his life. So if you want to know more about this amazing fellow, then uh, read this specific biography, uh, because it really goes into a lot of detail and breaks down much of the documented information from Richard Feynman himself, as well as other people, and uh, intertwines it into a nice story. It is like listening to a story, which is one of the reasons why I listen to a lot of biographies while I'm driving, because biographies are like stories. So check this one out, and let's go on to book number eight, I think it is, or nine. Yes, book number nine. All right, book number nine is Total Recall by Arnold Schwarzenegger himself. The book was amazing. It's also another book that I listened to on audiobook while driving. It's definitely a great read to listen to while driving because it's quite a long book, I think what, 650 pages, maybe 700 pages. So listening to that book and listening to his life was very interesting. And I, I have always been a big fan of Arnold Schwarzenegger since uh, the late 80s and early 90s when I was a kid, uh, watching The Terminator and The Terminator 2 um, and any of his other movies. But I learned a whole lot about how he got to that point from reading his biography. He literally starts from almost like 
when he was born. And he talks a lot about his childhood, his brothers, his mom and his dad, about how his dad really helped to build in that routine into his life. He talked about the condition of the country at the time, which was, I believe, in the uh, 40s, like after World War II. So, you know, the country was kind of recovering. And he talks about how that affected him, uh, what sort of mindset he had. And he was into bodybuilding from a very young age um, because he had not a whole lot of other things to do. So he wanted to set goals for himself from the very beginning. And in order to reach those goals, he really need to, to, needed to kind of have a plan. And uh, another thing that I learned about him from the very beginning is that he wanted to become an actor. He wanted to become an American citizen. He wanted to make millions from the movies he made. Uh, that he starred in, even when he was a child. Maybe he didn't know the specifics at that time, but he knew exactly what he wanted. So I learned a whole lot about this idol that I personally had as a child. And I learned about how he really set goals and achieved them and followed through with them. It talks about his bodybuilding career. It talks about his transition from uh, being an Austrian to becoming an American. It talks about his process of going through his first film, uh, through his second film and some of his other films that he, he did. It talks about Terminator, of course. And uh, it talks about his transition from being an action star to being uh, an action slash comedy star um although his comedy movies were not the best uh they were still pretty funny arnold schwarzenegger has his funny ways of doing things you know and uh then of course it talks about his transition from being an actor to becoming a politician and also one thing that i learned about arnold that i didn't know before uh his ex-wife uh, what what was her name again? Maria Schreiber, I believe. Uh, I had no idea that they had connections to the Kennedys. So he basically married into the Kennedy family, not the direct Kennedys, but the uh, uh, cousins of the Kennedys. And so that was a nice little fact to know. And uh, also his relationship with uh, George Bush. Um, that was interesting. George Bush Sr., not Jr., um, and yeah, there's just so many different things that were really cool to learn about the, the idol of mine. And uh, I recommend if you're interested in Arnold Schwarzenegger to read his autobiography. Okay, last but not least is Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. So I really loved this book. Nike was created in Oregon which is something that I was really excited about to read uh, because there's a whole lot of references about Oregon in here. I'm from Oregon for those people that don't know, specifically Portland, Oregon. So there's a lot of uh, references to Portland, Oregon, even Portland State University, which I had no idea that Phil Knight used to be like an instructor at Portland State University. Surprised there. And he met his wife there as well. She was actually one of his students. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, he taught like accounting or something like that. Um, and so the, all these little details that I had no idea before, uh, I learned about this guy and I learned about Nike. And uh, one of like, I'm a huge runner. I love running, although I don't do it enough. Um, but yeah, I was uh, cross country in the high school. And of course, the, the shoes, Nike shoes, were originally created for just running. That's the only type of line that they had. And um, the, the coach of, I believe it was uh, University of Oregon, uh, this was Bowerman. He was a partner in uh, Nike. 
and he was like the uh, research and development department. Basically, he did all the experimentation on the shoes. Uh, and he would even like when uh, before Nike was even like created and stuff like that, um, he would experiment with making his own shoes and uh, he would test out his shoes on his runners from the university. So Phil Knight himself being a runner uh, and being part of that team would wear the sh the experimental shoes and uh, get timed it. So all these details are just so fascinating and fun to learn about. And uh, I also had no idea that originally um, Phil Knight and Nike before Nike, the name Nike existed, uh, like teamed up with a Japanese company called Onitsuka, uh, and they had their tigers and Phil Knight was trying to sell the tigers here in the, the West coast in California and Oregon, uh, not just the West coast, but I guess they branched out to other parts as well of the U S I had no idea about this stuff, had no idea. So now I know the name Onisuka and of course, Onisuka still exists. Tiger still exists, but, um, Phil Knight branched off with his own brand of shoe because the Japanese were not very good business partners for him and they were not treating him very well. If you want to read the story, pick up the book itself, but uh, I'm just giving you a short little recap here and just showing my enthusiasm for, <laughs> for this. Uh, the topic is, is great because, well, I love running. So shoes from now on, whenever I buy running shoes, I'm getting Nike. It's a good selling point for Nike. <laughs> to read this book. Um, uh, another little tidbit here that I was very excited about. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of a backstory, there's this guy named uh, Prefontaine. What's his first name? I forget. But anyway, Prefontaine was a famous college runner uh, who died very, too young. And one thing that I didn't know is that he knew Phil Knight and he was one of the representatives for nike when they were first starting out um and so yeah prefontaine would wear the nike shoes during his races and uh yeah he definitely died way too young but anyway the backstory the reason why this was significant to me is because during cross country during my high school years uh back in the early 2000s Every time before we had a major uh, cross-country meet, we would watch uh, the movie about Prefontaine. The title is Prefontaine. And uh, the movie was, you know, pretty inspiring because you got this very, very, very fast runner um, who sets records and stuff like that. And uh, just a very inspiring story, but sad as well because he dies at the end, just like in real life, of course, uh, in a car crash. And this was before he gets a chance to prove himself as one of the fastest runners. So uh, anyway, that's beside the point. I just love the book. I love all the little details, and it really deserves to be on your bookshelf, this book here. So that is my top 10 list of 2022. I think you really should read these, at least some of them that interest you in 2023 or and beyond. Um, I've got a wide variety of books here for everyone. Um, so yeah, if you're a runner, read Shoe Dog. If you're a teacher or and or a parent, read The Self-Driven Child. If you want to become more like a polymath, read The Polymath. If you're having difficulty being an adult, read um, Your Turn, How to Be an Adult. So yeah, you got a wide range of books here. So enjoy and I'll see you in the next video. Make sure you're subscribed as well. Don't forget that. And yeah, I'll see you in the next video, everyone. Take care.